Thank you for joining us this afternoon. The Hispanic Heritage Committee has decided to honor Doña Elena Gallegos this year for Hispanic Heritage Month. She was quite a woman. Uh, women in colonial New Mexico retained their identities, their name, and their rights. Uh, they could involve themselves in land deals, purchase homes, trade for goods, and even fulfill their dying wishes. What type of genealogical material or research can be found in these documents that she left behind are wonderful items for us as uh, descendants of Doña Elena. Many of you might know if you've been to Albuquerque or live in Albuquerque that there's a lot of items or places or things named after Elena. Um, it was first b b the land grant that went back and then in 1978 they started petitioning for an open space. Uh, we were lucky enough that Senator Domenici uh, legislated for a land swap with Academy schools and uh, in 1982, it was signed as a deal, um, which is why we have the Elena Gallegos open space. Last, in uh, 2018, we were able to celebrate her as a woman in history with a marker uh, that's down in the right-hand corner that sits up at the trailhead of the open space. Um, and if you haven't seen it, I urge all people to go there and take a visit. Now, Hispanic Albuquerque goes back to uh, the early days of its founding around 1706. There is no doubt in our minds that Elena Gallegos lived her entire life once she was brought back in 1693 to the Albuquerque area. She married a Frenchman, uh, Santiago or Jacques Grolet, um, and he was a good friend of, of Jean Larchevec. So we have two Frenchmen living in New Mexico. Uh, they were arrested and jailed for trespassing on Spanish territory, taken to Mexico City, to Spain, back to Mexico City, and they finally decided that they would come here to New Mexico to settle down. Elena married Santiago, and kind of their life story begins in 1699. Gurley would not live into old age as he passed away in 1711, around the age of 48. At that time, Elena had one child who she continued to raise on her own. The plaza here of Alburquerque uh, is a par part of many land grants. And New Mexico has legacies that are land, land grant involved. The leadership uh, that they portray in old documents show that many women were willing to fight for what was willing to be theirs, their children's, and their descendants. And we can you know, thank Elena Gallegos because we wouldn't have open spaces in schools and parks if she hadn't of acquired some land and in the time that she did. Um, land could be left to their husbands or children when they died if they saw fit to do that. Most women did not travel without a male person in tow, but regardless of how they got where they were going, they still could sign their names on documents, they could sue in courts, and they used the legal system to their best advantage. Women's rights in colonial New Mexico are very different than they are today. Women kept their name, their surname. So Elena Gallegos was always Elena. They kept their dowries. Men had dowries also, but women's uh, dowries were maintained for their use if something were to happen to their husbands. They could buy and sell land. They could sue for rights to own land, if people encroached on their land, they could own animals, they could be involved in the merchant trade. Um, they didn't really need a lot of their husbands say in matters that pertain to their own livelihoods in many cases. Now women did not hold government offices like today, um, but they could testify as witnesses. So they were an integral part of their everyday communities uh, during the colonial period. So what do we know about Doña Elena? We know that she comes from a very large and powerful, the Baca family clan. Uh, the Gallegos were also very powerful. She fled with her family as a baby in 1680 to El Paso del Norte, what we call Juarez today. And there's a period in her life as a small child from about 1680 to 1692 that we know very little about her. I've often wondered if she went back to Paral to live with her Gallegos um, ancestors, but a woman born in 1680 and returning in 1692, she clearly had uh, feet in two centuries by the time her life ended. Um, she's just, a, again, a remarkable woman. 
So here's a little bit of a genealogical chart that shows Elena over here, her, her father and his family, and Catalina Baca and her family. Um, she's one of, of the many Baca people that settled in what we call then as the Rio Bajo of New Mexico. So let's talk a little bit about Jacques Grolet. Um, he was a French citizen who was um, part of the La Salle expedition that ended up um, abandoned in Texas and eventually was uh, arrested, uh, went to Spanish prison, came back. We've already talked about that a little bit. But he eventually came to New Mexico. A lot of people, you know, his, he switched his name from Jacques to Santiago. Uh, today that would be James. And he signed his name in many documents as, as I have it here, Grole. Uh, today we see the spelling a little different, Gurule. Um, so under Spanish law, everyone would make a deathbed wish. So um, this is what happened with Elena. Traditionally, if they died, let's say they had a heart attack or something and they couldn't do that, there were intestate uh, documents of their estates that would have been handled. Many of these wills, there's over 450 of them, uh, survive today and they're part of the Spanish archives of New Mexico. And if you're interested in them, um, they're very interesting. They're not much different than what we would do today in terms of having uh, a will. So just to kind of focus on this, uh, women and men both kept separate records of what they brought to the marriage. We call that a dowry. I often laugh at people when I talk about dowries because I always ask how many people in the room document what they brought to the marriage and you hardly get anybody that raises their hand. Uh, women retain their rights to hold onto their property until death and then when they die they could leave it to their children so not necessarily their spouse. Um, if she married a second time uh, those monies and goods from the first marriage or the first the spouse that died would be retained for those uh, living children that they had in common. So there was a lot of um, care for children and thought forward thinking in terms of uh, having a way for them to make a way in the world, basically. So using her will and probates in my research um, about Doña Elena, and here's a copy of her uh, signature. She signs it, Doña Elena Gallegos, and she has her own little rubric at the end, uh, which is for her own name only. Uh, we can answer a lot of questions. We can answer questions such as heirs, children, spouses, what items they owned. Um, and not, they're not just for rich people. A lot of people did wills in New Mexico, and they were from all walks of life. Some of the details that I found were interesting is Elena could write and sign her own name. She cites herself as a humble and poor widow. Uh, she managed her large ranching operation. She talks about her son, her brother. And so she clearly wanted to leave a legacy to her son in terms of what she did in her life and pass that on to him. She names her husband. Uh, she declares in six, that she was married to him and they married on 10 December 1699 in Bernalillo. Um, she notes which lands they purchased together. Um, and part of the land that she had, she gave to her brother, Felipe, uh, which is hardly done, uh, but she had to get her son's permission in order to do that so that this estate would be settled uh, and there wouldn't any, be any disputes um, after that. Here's another record where she's a, a godparent to Andres Aragon, uh, son of Ignacio Aragon and Luisa Baca. So Luisa's her first cousin. Um, and so, again, they live their lives like we would live today. They're, they act as godparents, they go to church, they own land, they raise cattle. So, again, as a married couple, they were out and about in Bernalillo. In 1712, she asks for a brand, which is up in that corner, kind of a heart-shaped um, looking thing. Uh, but in the, in the document itself, I'm going to read this to you. It says, I, Doña Elena Gallegos, widow of Santiago Gurule and resident of the mining district of Bernalillo, appear before your excellency asking that all privileges under the royal laws be allowed and that I can register a brand. And so her brand is really the first documented brand that we have in New Mexico. A lot of people had brands, but to have a surviving document is really just 
I think, spectacular. She wanted the brand that she, in order that I may brand my stock and horses so that no person may rob me, and with the condition that I and my children may take possession of any animals or stock that so brand is on. And she goes on and she signs her name. And so again, you know, just a little humble asking for this. They gave it to her. It's signed Doña Elena Gallegos. And I just think that's just fascinating. Again, part of that, her will we, shows that she had 32 branded cattle, a yoke of oxen. So in those days, they used oxen to pull uh, wagons. She had mares, a stallion, and some colts, and two mules, kind of like a he mule and a she mule. But uh, she had uh, animals, and you need animals when you have a ranch. She also had clothing in her will. She had silk petticoats, a shawl, a mantilla that she would have worn, uh, coral bracelets, uh, religious items in frames, and wooden chests. Uh, people used chests in those days to store clothing. Uh, some of the big, larger wooden ones might have been used for food, but the leather traveling coach was definitely for people going back and forth on the Camino Real. She would have had a, her mantilla that she talked about, and some of the things that are not included in her will are medicinals. I mean, I think all New Mexicans um, my age or older, maybe even younger, um, know about all the cures that grandma had and the herbs and those kinds of things. So. A typical kitchen of that time might have had some dried herbs hanging from the ceiling and gourds and different things, dried um, calabacitas and squash uh, that they would have used for cooking. So this is a picture of, of the food that might have been hanging in her kitchen. And they used pottery, they used bowls, um, they used um, urns, they had chocolate pots, they had cups. And so, you know, just a very simple life, but again, things that you need on an everyday type of um, environment to live. She had jewelry. A lot of people are surprised that Spanish colonial women wore jewelry. Um, hers were very simple, but a beautiful coral bracelet, a reliquary with a silver frame for her, you know, her religion was important to her. Uh, so things like that that, you know, helps develop a picture or a portrait for us of what kind of person Doña Elena would have been. She also talks about that she had no debts. Um, that's remarkable for a woman on her own, a widow for so long. Uh, she mentions things, you know, her two servants, Elena and Rosa, her son Antonio, her brother Felipe signed her will for her and uh, she survives her older brother, Antonio, uh, who she came back with after the Pueblo Revolt. So again, Antonio being her older brother and who her son was named after. So uh, again, a Hispanic cultural practice that we still practice in New Mexico today. Um, Antonio Gallegos also had a will, uh, declared a lot of land in the Rio Bajo, which is part of Albuquerque, he had a lot of sheep, big and small, cattle, uh, bulls, yearlings, again, another person in the family that was a rancher. I mean, they all delved in the same kind of um, business, basically. Um, he also had horses and mules um, that were part of his entire will. Her brother, Felipe, who she appears to be closer to, um, she leaves him a little piece of land uh, he was married twice and is a neighbor to Elena, so they live next door to each other. Uh, again, just the three siblings. So I wanted to copy this out, just uh, kind of a chuckle, but Antonio, her son, also was heavily involved in land grants. And there was an acequia dispute um, between Cristobal Garcia and Isabel Jorge, and Felipe Gallegos gets involved, and then Antonio Gurley gets involved, but in the top, up here, you can see where he signs his name, Antonio Gurule, as we spell it today. And then down here, he signs it again on a different document, Antonio Grole. And so I don't know if he just kind of had a little silliness about him that he just wanted to sign differently, or he used both signatures, and everybody still knew that it was him. Um, this is what the land grant looks um, today. But Elena, in her, her will, says that they purchased the land. 
that it was not really a land grant. It was a land grant prior to her purchasing it. Um, it was then known as the Jesus Maria grant. And aren't we lucky that she changed, the name was changed to Elena Gallegos. I mean, it just, it's very heartfelt to that. Um, she wants to live on the grant to cultivate it. It's on the other side of the river and she will leave this to her children and descendants basically, which is what most Spanish colonial people did in those times. Antonio Gerlet, her only child, was born in 1703 in Bernalillo. Again, the Baca family um, are her godparents, the godparents to Antonio. He weds in 1721 to Antonio Quintana. He has that acequia dispute, but he also is involved in land grants up in Jemez, the lands that his mother left him, um, and some other lands along the Rio Puerco. He has a will also, which is dated 1761. So again, this whole notion that people didn't have wills back in colonial times, um, we have one for her brother Antonio, Elena, and now Antonio. So generationally, these land grants do come up uh, quite a bit. And here again, he signs his name, and that's a copy of his baptism record up at the top in the baptism book for Bernalillo. Antonio and his mother um, are godparents uh, over in Zia Mission, and as I often tell people, uh, very well thought of people are godparents, because when somebody would die, if the parents were to die, they would take that children or child, many, many times they have many children, um, and raise that child in their household and teach them Catholicism and raise them into adulthood. So as a godparent and a guardian, they would also um, have access or oversee any funds or cattle or whatever that might have been left to that one child. Again, with F Felipe, her brother, she's also a godparent. Uh, so they took this very seriously. There's some dates in her will. Of course, 1731 is when the will is, is done. She dies in September of 1731. My guess is that she was, she was sick. So to go from May to September, um, she knew she was probably dying. Um, the will is examined in 1732 and then affirmed, and they bury her in Old Town Albuquerque uh, beneath the church, the baptismal font. Uh, she's asked, this is a copy of her um, burial record. It says, Elena Española in the margin. Just very simple. Uh, again, she was a widow by that time. So things that she requested upon her death is that she be shrouded in the habit of St. Francis, which is very common for New Mexicans. You would be shrouded in a blue uh, robe and buried. She requested that she be buried in the parish of Albuquerque. Um, she asked for a high mass uh, and a vigil. So again, they had to pay for that. So she had monies put aside for her to actually uh, have her wishes, her deathbed wishes um, done, basically. So um, kind of put this together, 51-year-old uh, Elena Gallegos uh, lies beneath the floor of this parish church. Now to really you know, talk about her 1680 to 1731, she spends most of her days as a widow. She cares for her only son, Antonio, in the lands that she describes were purchased by her and her husband. Little is actually known about her life except that she left a will, a brand, and a legacy that still to this day use her name as one of the largest land grants in the Albuquerque area. One cannot come to Albuquerque without seeing Elena Gallegos Park, land grant, open space, picnic area, and so on. Her name is depicted on maps, signs, brochures, and the internet. <laughs> and I'm proud to let people know that I am a descendant of Doña Elena and through her documents, I've gotten to know her, her son, the land, and many of us today are 16th generation New Mexicans, and many descend from her. She's a true Hispanic colonial woman. Without women such as her, our own culture and history would leave us wanting for more. Thank you. <laughs>